Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Laura Seking, and I'm manager of preservation and outreach at Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District. Before I introduce today's speaker, um, just a few technical announcements. All participants will be muted throughout the event. You're not unable to, you're not able to unmute yourself or turn your video on. If you'd like to ask a question, please do so via chat. I'll read them over at the end of the talk. So I know this is not our usual time for our public events, but this is for a very, very good reason. Penny Spark is a British professor, writer, and the person to go when it comes to the history of design. She has given keynote addresses, curated exhibitions, and published widely in the subject of design history with a special interest in the areas of interiors, identities, gender, and taste. One of the many books she published focused on Elsie the Wolf and the birth of modern interior design. Professor Spark, we're delighted to have you here today to talk a little bit about the Wolf's New York. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about Elsie de Wolf, and I'm kind of assuming everybody's heard of her. Um, maybe not, don't know all her work, but know at least of her existence. Um, so we'll focus on New York and, and her work there. She did a lot of work in New York, but it's just perhaps important to say at the beginning, she also worked across the US and in Europe, in France particularly. But she had her professional office in New York right up until 1937. The work she did in New York uh, was mostly private residences, including two of her own homes, which we'll talk about. But she also designed an, a woman's club, a college residence building, or interiors rather, her own showrooms and some hotels. So it's a range of public and private spaces. And what I'm gonna do is a very simple um, exercise. I'm just gonna go through it chronologically really and show you, and it will fit, it, with her life really you'll sort of see her her developing as a designer as we go through so i'm, I'm looking at the new york buildings and going through it um in chronological order so elsie de wolf was born actually as ella anderson de wolf on the 20th december 1865 in new york city and her early life was spent in a brownstone building um, which was decorated in a very heavy victorian style which she hated and when her father died in 1890, leaving them penniless, Elsie was forced to move into acting and she'd always had a propensity for um, amateur acting, but she moved professionally in order to earn a living. And that actually meant her moving down a rung or two of the social ladder really. And it actually led to her work in interior decoration because acting at that time, you were as much a kind of show horse for, for fashion as you, were a, um, as you were an actress. And her fashionability led her to design the interiors of her own home. And in turn, other people then asked her to do theirs. So it kind of flowed from there. Following the First World War, she actually spent more and more time in France and she had an affinity with France through her whole life. But she eventually made it her own home after the First World War. But she did continue to come to New York on a regular basis. And as I said, her office is there um, until 37. So, it's a long period of time. So I'm just literally going to go through the buildings that she built, tell you a little bit about them, um, how her philosophy of design developed through them as well. And we're starting with 122 East 17th Street. Um, the dates of that, well, they lived there between 1892 and 1910. Now, DeWolf and her theatrical manager and companion, who you can see there, Elizabeth Marbury, with their little dogs, lived in this small rented house on the corner of East 17th Street and Irving Place for actually for 18 years. It was a, had a simple brownstone exterior and you can see the, the, it's the corner house that you can see. The first room, sorry, the first floor comprised a long drawing room, which you can see on the left. And there was a dining room while well, there were two bedrooms on the second floor and above them a library. So a fairly compact house. And what DeWolf did was set about redecorating it. So it was already decorated when they arrived, but she wanted to modernize it. And she conceived her redecoration of the interior as a kind of act of restoration. And she likened it to reviving an old garden. 
for the first five years of their time there, the two women lived really with the cluttered high Victorian character. And you can see that on the right. Um, a photograph from 1896 shows a Turkish, what they call a cosy corner with these cushions raised on the plinth, which was a Victorian trope really. And it bore witness to the contemporary interest in Orientalism, um, much loved by the advocates of the house beautiful. So this is before she redecorates it. But during um, 1987 and the first half of 18, sorry, 1897 and the first half of 1898, she sets about replacing high Victorianism with a modern look. And I'm giving you in these two slides a before and after. It's the same room, the dining room, but you can see what she's done. She has stripped it back, taken out of the clutter, painted the wood white, painted the, um, given the, the table a glass top, um, put a, a bust on the fireplace with a mirror um, and basically simplified it. And, and but some, some features remain, but you can see what she's done there. And she basically did that to the whole house. So this is what she, she did, she, she modernized. And although it's not modern movement or sort of modernism, it's modern compared to what was there before. The women's home increasingly became a site for fashionable entertaining, especially on Sunday afternoons when numerous well-known figures from the worlds of theater, literature, art, philosophy, business and politics squeezed into the small house and sat on the stairs, eating sandwiches, drinking tea, coffee and engaging in conversation. So it became a kind of a soiree, although it was an afternoon, not, not an evening. So that was how they lived and, and it was her first go at interior decoration as an amateur. So as I've said, um, that led to people asking her to do theirs. And then when she realized that she'd come to the end of her acting life at around the age of about 40, she thought, well, I, I will give interior decoration a go as a professional. And she made a little card, sent it out. So by 1905, she was in demand as a professional decorator. And the first work that she really did in New York of note um, was the Colony Club. Now, the idea for a women's club, which would have a social and a leisure role, as well as providing a place for professional women to stay when they were um, in town, from perhaps from other parts of the States, had been conceived by somebody called Mrs. Borden Harriman. She secured a plot of land on Madison Avenue and the services of the architect Stamford White, um, a member of the highly successful um, New York practice of McKim Mead and White, which you, you will know. And for this new venture, he decided to work in the colonial style. And you can see that on the left, that's the exterior of the club. And it's a very interesting project for um, an interior decorator to, to take on. So in 1905, DeWolf was selected as the club's interior coordinator. That's what she was called. Interesting that she moves from amateur professional so quickly, but um, White had been one of those people who'd gone and sat on the stairs and had sandwiches in her, uh, in her own home. And, uh, and it was through connections really, and through Marbury that um, she was put forward for this job. And it was White who persuaded the board to take her on. And the task she undertook there was very wide ranging. It, it went beyond just sort of color and, and um, furniture. They, she did things like um, supplying the mantelpieces, actually going down to the, the port and, and getting them and bringing them. She advised on cornices and wall treatments and she requested where the electric outlets will go. So it was a kind of, it was beyond a very superficial job. However, things were complicated by the fact that White was shot dead by an ex-lover's husband in June 1906 and was unable to complete the project. But, however, but in spite of this, really, the decorator continued to correspond with his firm and to complete the decoration. Now, the building itself was, it was a six floor building and the central hallway led to a main hall, which you can see on the right. And Wolf claimed that she wanted this to resemble the spacious entrance area of a large Virginia house. That was her claim. And she introduced here, and although you can't see it terribly clearly, I'm afraid, the same green and white striped wallpaper that she'd used in her own home. That was the one that she'd used in the dining room. And it was a very fresh, spacious and light space. And it contrasted sharply with the gloominess of most men's clubs at that time. So again, we're seeing her modernizing, going in with lightness as opposed to darkness. 
And that was very visible, I think, in some of the rooms, um, which of course, unfortunately, you're seeing in black and white, but were actually quite brightly colored. Um, a trellis room and a reading room led off the main hall. The first was one of the club's most strikingly original interiors. This is the one on the left, the trellis building. And she was very original in bringing trellis inside, particularly into an urban setting. And it, it brought a kind of fresh outdoor country feel into the building. And she used this green trellis, combining it with straw backed dining chairs, which she actually designed herself. So she went in, into furniture design as well, designing pieces and getting them made um, to fit into the space that she, she worked on. The reading room on the right was a much more English affair containing an Adam mantelpiece, white and ivory walls, a green blue rug, mahogany bookcases and a range of small side tables. Comfortable armchairs, a sofa, a fireside seat, some chintz covered side chairs co-mingled in a kind of relaxing atmosphere. But perhaps one of the most striking rooms um, was actually up on the on the fifth floor and it was called the strangers room it was a room where you could bring um, non-members in to dine and it was a beautiful room it actually had um, Everett Shin uh, paintings on the wall and she introduced a color scheme and I think try and imagine these colors because again you can't see them but they're very light and bright yellowy tan pinky yellow and gray complemented by a rose petal rug so light pinks grays yellows and the room contains a french table and chairs um and there's a wall mounted camp candelabra so it was a very fresh light um room which i think if you compare back with say the the turkish cozy corner and the kind of clutter and the heaviness of victorian interiors you can begin to see why she was seen as modern in her time so that was interesting that she started off with a non-domestic product uh, um, interior really, and quite a big project as well. Now, another project that she was given in 1907, in fact, was another non-domestic project. And this was the decoration of the interior of a new dormitory building called Brooks Hall, which was being created for New York's, new York's first women's college, Barnard College, which is part of Columbia University. The school opened in 1889, had, which opened um, earlier in a, in, on Madison Avenue, 343, in, in, in an ordinary brownstone house. But the architectural team of Lamb and Rich were invited in and they created the building you see on the left, which is a steel framed building with nine floors. And it contained 97 students rooms. So this is essentially what she was doing. She was, she was brought in. Um, in, in a way, because of the Colony Club, she'd done all that the, um, the the rooms that women stayed in. This is a sort of a, a, a sort of a sort of less sumptuous version because this is students' rooms, but it's the same concept of designing for, for women in their own rooms. This Brooks Hall was considered more on the right. You can see just to let you know you can see the um, the sort of general parlour where they, they mingled. It was considered more modern than the other Barnard College halls. It was lit by electricity, heated by steam, had hot and cold running water in each room and an elevator service. It was also conveniently positioned next to a subway for downtown shopping. So these are some of the rooms for students that um, DeWolf worked on. Um, to, to quote a letter from the time as uh, she wrote herself to, to the woman who commissioned her, it is understood that I'm to undertake the decoration and furnishing of Brooks Hall for the sum of $30,000 and her commission was, was 10% of that $3,000. So she was responsible for the parlor, which we've just seen, the reception room, the dining room, and all the 97 bedroom suites. And she provided each study bedroom with an identical set of basic equipment, a rug, a couch bed, a study table, one straight chair, one easy chair, one screen, one towel rack, one glass shelf. You can't necessarily see all those things in here because they've been personalized um, and used, but essentially it was a kind of standardized model, which was then varied um, in different ways. Um, each room had chintz curtains of varied light patterns, which you can see the chintz curtains in the room on the left and a cover for couch of couch of the same pattern. You can see on the left again, that, that um, easy chair has the same fabric on it. 
while a level of individuality was provided through the chintzes because they were different in different rooms, the decorator made sure that they had the same cream color linings. This is really interesting. And I quote, so that all the windows may present the same appearance from the street. So from the street, you just saw the, the linings of the curtains, so everything looked absolutely identical, but the actual chintzes used were different. Now all the rooms com combined a high level of comfort with a sense of the lifestyle needs of female student who might want to work alone at times or at others to entertain a friend in a light modern space. I think you can get a sense of that. And then on top of that, items were brought in to indiv individualize even further. Mirrors, pictures, cushions, tea sets, footstools, vases of flowers, framed photographs, etc. And if you just look at these images quickly, you'll see how those individualized items were brought in, both by DeWolf, but also by the students themselves. But the idea was to give them a kind of warm domestic feel. And whereas DeWolf had used mahogany in the Colony Club to convey the appropriate sense of opulence, in Brooks Hall, she util utilized oak to give it a lighter feel. So there's a lightness compared to, the, I mean, the Colony Club was light, but this is kind of even lighter and younger, maybe. The furniture selected was simple and robust, some of it conforming to the contemporary taste for mission or arts and crafts. So it was an interesting project and it was, it was early 1907. Now I'm moving on to 1910. I'm just taking you gradually as, as her career develops what, what she did. What she actually did was two, she, she went back and back to the brownstone. I think because she'd been brought up in one and hated it, she wanted to conquer it and make it look modern and, and light, whereas they, they, they had been very heavy and dark. This is East uh, 71st Street. And this was built, interestingly, it was built in a way to look like a home for her and Marbury, but actually it was a show home. It was never lived in. It was used as a kind of a, a kind of model ideal home. So she, what she wanted to do was turn a dark and dismal brownstone into a light and cheery home. And what she did was buy it, decorate it, use it as a showroom and then sell it for profit. So she was an incredibly astute businesswoman from day one, um, making profits wherever she could. And she worked with this um, project with Ogden Codman, who again, I'm sure you know of. And what they did first was to move the entrance from the second to the first floor. So they took the, the, the entrance down the floor and introduced a few steps down into a little courtyard. I'll show you in a moment what that looked like in a different house. Now, one of, it, one of the house's most striking features was its, was its entrance hall, which you can see on the left, with its black and white tiled marble floor. Um, she really loved entrance halls. She thought they were important because they welcomed you in, and she's got this wonderful stove in it, and, and um, as, uh, the, the lovely floor. Now, the full width of the front of the second floor, I mean, I'd call that first floor, but you call it second floor, was used as a drawing room which was decorated in her usual French style. The French style, Louis says, and Louis Cairns, Louis says, the 15th and 16th were her mainstay. And she used it here and you can see that you, it kind of looks not lived in, I think that in that drawing, it looks like a sort of staged interior. The walls were cream, the woodwork was white and the dominant, dominant color was rose red. She loved whites, creams, the pastels and rose, pink and red. And now, as I say, she hadn't designed it as a family house, but rather as a home intended for habitation by two women, even though it, it never actually became that, but that was its kind of brief to itself. Given its autobiographical nature, it's not surprising perhaps that she used it as a model for her next home, decorated with herself, uh, with herself and Marbury in mind. So um, they, they started off in the um, Irving Place home and by 19... 10, 11, um, DeWolf was wanting to design a new home for the couple. And this is the one, and you can see that this is now East 55th Street, but you can see they've done the same thing. They've taken the entrance down a floor and introducing a small courtyard. And again, um, she gave the hall a black and white marble floor. Now this is intended for them to live in, so it's a very different thing from the, from the first one. There's, there's much more detail in it, it's much more, livable in if you like and I think the drawing room on this on the second floor was perhaps one of the her most admired interiors she created there and again you can see the use of of um 
French Louis style furniture. She loves using marble fireplaces, sconces either side, mirrors behind, um, and then conversation um, arrangements of the furniture and pictures on the wall. It's a kind of signature style. It's a French style, but she's bringing it in um, to America, to New York at a time when Victorianism, William Morris and heavy Victorianism had been the norm. So I think this room was highly admired. She created a tranquil, homely space, dominated again by one of her favorite colors, which was rose. So this color rose comes over and over again. And as she said, the room was overtly created for con conviviality, for hospitality. Now, unlike the rather staged drawing room that we've just seen, this was much lived in. Um, and it's here photographed with um, flowers on the mantelpiece, which again was one of her signatures. She always used either lilies or roses, always um, cream colored, white cream color. Uh, the dining room in this, this house, um, oh, sorry, I haven't got the dining room. I'll, come, I'll just describe it to you. The dining room was grander than its predecessor and the color scheme was gray. And she did something she did very, very often, which was to use the, have a lovely um, rug on the floor and then take the colors from the rug, which were very often these pastels, pinks, grays, pale yellows, using them for the color scheme of the house. Now, the third floor, the room above this, was dedicated to the private quarters. Um, both DeWolf and Marbury had their own rooms. And it's interesting that although DeWolf intended it for the two women, we don't get a great sense of Marbury living there, really. In fact, um, uh, Marbury wrote her, an autobiography and she talks very affectionately about the 17th Street house, which we looked at at the beginning, but she doesn't mention these 55th Street house. So one sense is she didn't really engage with it fully. Now, the East 55th Street provided DeWolf with opportunities for privacy, companionship, entertainment. She described it as, in its proportions, balance, arrangements, furnishings, objet d'art, atmosphere, <coughs> and suitability of purpose, it was as perfect a city house as the two of us could have had. Ironically, however, she only spent three winters there, 1911, 1912, 1913. And the advent of the First World War changed everything. But her life began to focus increasingly on France rather than the USA. So although it was intended as this absolutely sort of perfect home, it wasn't ever really inhabited. And in fact, Marbury moved to Sutton Place in, in um, 1920 and the contents of this house were sold completely. But it wasn't ever fully lived in, as I say. OK, I'm going to move on to something a little bit differently. So that, that's, that's her second home in New York that she, she designed herself. She also designed homes for a group of women with whom she um, spent a lot of time, one of whom was Anne Morgan, the daughter of J.P. Morgan. Now, Morgan had bought a large brownstone mansion um, on Madison Avenue in the late 1870s. It was a block of three actually built in the 1850s. And Anne Morgan chose to stay in her parents' home until 1921. Having said that, she had an entire floor um, and she had a, her own squash court and uh, it was not a tiny little bed sit in her parents' home. It was a massive space, but it was inside her father's home. She had her own suite of rooms and DeWolf was invited to decorate it. The main sitting room, which you can see on the left, was a striking room decorated in black, white, and red. So they're actually one of the more striking colors than she's used up until this point. A large um, rug on the floor was um, bordered by ruby red, which you can't see, unfortunately. And she used the same um, colors for the curtain. So there is a bright red sense in this room, which again, can't tell from the black and white, I'm afraid. <clears throat> now, in the book called The House in Good, House in Good Taste, which perhaps the book is best known for, which she penned and was published in 1913, which actually was penned by a um, somebody else, but to, to her ideas. Um, she il illustrated the little room on the right, which is actually Anne Morgan's dressing room. And I've shown that because, although it's a very small and very delicate room, it's a very, very beautiful little room, actually. If you look at the, the um, prints, the chintzes used and the, the, the panelling, and in fact, again, it was in pastel colours. But the, the, the idea of a dressing room was very important to DeWolf because she believed that everybody should have one. I mean, she had these you know, rather grandiose 
ideas that everybody lived this wonderful life. Um, so rather than catering, catering for all a woman's needs in a single bedroom, she preferred a division of the space into an antechamber, a sitting room or boudoir, a sleeping room, a dressing room and a bathroom. So she, she thought that rather having one big space, women's space should have these little spaces and the dressing room was very important. And she writes in the book about the importance of having a mirror in the, in the room so you can see the back of your head and you know the idea that you can actually sort of dress yourself and do your makeup and your hair and create your own identity because she's very keen on seeing women's identity as being formed within the interior spaces they inhabit. And that, if you like, is her philosophy in a nutshell. And she's working mostly with women and she's working mostly um, to create spaces for them to create their identities within. Now, having said that she worked mostly with women, I'm now going to give you an exception. And there were, there were two or three, but not many. Now, on January the 27th, 1914, we're moving forward a bit now, DeWolf contacted Henry Clay Frick herself, suggesting that she take cha charge of the feminine aspects of the interior of his new building. He was creating a very grand new building on 1 East 70th Street and on the, on the first floor um, were, the, were the women's quarters. And she wrote in her letter to, to Frick, she, she's very forward, she approaches people, that's how she gets to work very often. She says, please don't forget me. I'm specially good at detail and the fitting up and the comfort of women's rooms, the intimate little tricks that no mere man, however clever he may be, will ever know. So that was her trademark. I can come in and I can do the women's rooms. I know what they want and I can do it for you. So the result was that DeWolf, Frick and his wife Adelaide worked together on the furnishing and decoration of Adelaide's bedroom and also Helen Frick's bedroom, the daughter as well as at five other bedrooms. So she came in and did the intimate spaces, the private spaces of this grand mansion. Adelaide Frick's bedroom, which you can see here, was decorated in blue with blue and cream silk used as curtains. I mean, it, it is clearly again in the French taste for this amazing bed. Um, she used the cream silk as curtains as, an, as, as upholstery fabric for the bed. So it's in blue and cream and for the, covers for the head um, and footboards and the bed canopy. Helen Frick's room was similarly put together, was finished in green and pink. So similar style, different colors. Now, sadly, Frick was not to live in the house long as he died five years after moving into it. And following the subsequent death of Adelaide in 1931, the house was transformed into a museum for Frick's collection as he'd always planned it to be. And when the second and third floors were turned into offices much later, unfortunately, most of DeWolf's work was dismantled. So you can't find it now. Although in the Frick collection, um, which is now we know the building to be, there are piece, a lot of pieces that DeWolf acquired for Frick from France in around 1914 that you can still see in the collection. So there's still remnants of it there. Okay, now moving forward chronologically quite speedily now. I'm moving up to 1920, which is after her um, return to, when she came, went to France and went back in 1916. And while she was in France, she lived in a, in a, a, a house called the Villa Trianon, just in Versailles, just outside Paris, which again was a, was a lifetime's work of decorating. But because we're talking about New York, I, I just mentioned that in passing, we won't, we won't dwell on it. Now, after her return to France in 1916, she kept a distance from many of the projects which were passing through her New York office. So her office keeps going till 37. So you've got this, got this picture of her working at a distance now. And she's, she's employing people. She's employing decorators, craftspeople, accountants, um, clerks, secretaries. It's a big office and it's a very successful money-making office. But she distanced herself from it. But she did involve, continue to involve herself with special commissions, especially when they involved friends. Now, the 10-year lease on the East 55th house, street house, which we looked at, which had created with uh, Codman, came to an end in 1920. And Marbury, even though she hadn't lived in it that much, I don't think, sought to relocate herself to new premises in New York. Now, this coincided a little later with Anne Vanderbilt, who was another um, close member of the female group, following her decision, following the death of her husband in 1920, to sell her Fifth Avenue home and move to a smaller house. And with Anne Morgan, 
moving away from her parents' house, um, and all three women ensconced themselves in houses in Sutton Place in New York City. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Sutton Place now because it's a, it's later. It's 1920. It's post World War One. It's it's after De Wolf moving to France, but she designs it, all the, the interiors of these three houses because it's three women she's very close to, and they ask her to do it. Now, the growing commercialism of the fashionable areas of New York City was forcing people to find new unspoiled areas in which to set up home. Marbury bought number 13 uh, Saturn Place, which you can see on the left, and she hired architect Mott B. Schmidt to oversee the modifications that she wanted to make to the building. She asked DeWolf to design the interior, and she created a fairly conservative, comfortable space with a level of elegance for her 65 year old friend. That's basically what happened. Um, in the library, for instance, which you can see on the right there, um, the room in which Marbury spent most of her time in the last years of her life, the decorator introduced a voluminous green leather sofa, so that's bright green or dark green maybe, that sofa you can see, and lining, lining the walls with fitted bookshelves. So it's a very kind of comfortable, conservative room, but it's, it's designed with the inhabitant in mind. Now in sharp contrast to the library and a small paneled dining room, which was actually a present from De Wolf, the room that the decorator created as her own sitting room at 13 Sutton Place was elegance itself. So De Wolf creates a sitting room for herself in this, in this building so that when she's in New York, um, over from Paris, over from France, she can stay and she stays in Marbury's house. The wood panelling of the walls was interrupted by old floral patterned wallpaper. And you can see um, something that she's starting to use now. And this is coming through in the post four years, which is animal skins. You can see the upholstery there and um, leopard, looks like leopard skin, but still the same French furniture, the same kind of Louis says, um, mirrors and detailing kind of Rococo, but um, with this rather modern animal skin twist. So she's always putting a twist in there. So 13 Saturn plays pr pr proved the ideal environment for Marbury to live out the last 13 years of her life. Now, when she died in 1933, she left the house and all her possessions to DeWolf and the decorator subsequently sold everything at auction. So at that point, their kind of life together and their kind of joint possessions were gone. Let's move to the next house, which is one Saturn place. So when Anne Vanderbilt's husband died in 1920, his widow purchased one Saturn place, the large corner building. Following Marbury, she also hired Mott B. Schmidt and Elsie DeWolf to transform the house into a home in which she could live. Schmidt designed a very restrained English Renaissance style house for Vanderbilt at a cost of $150,000, which was a lot at that time, comprising a basement and three floors. Now, given Vanderbilt's personal sophistication and great fortune, it's not surprising that the interiors were much more stylish than Marbury's. There was a strong chinoiserie theme, as you can see here, which was obviously part and parcel of the overall commitment to 18th century interior decor and furnishings. Um, so it's a much more extravagant, much more overtly decorated space. And also um, Vanderbilt had a lot of valuable furnishings herself and antiques, which needed to be integrated in the scheme. So it was a very different kind of um, interior. In the black and uh, white marble floor dining room, for example, um, she worked from a set of old Dutch decorative paintings and the color scheme and mural decoration she developed for that room flowed from them. So she kept that same idea of taking something small. She sometimes just take a pot which had two or three colors and then decorate, build a decorating scheme from that. Now, Anne Morgan joined both Marbury and Vanderbilt when she too moved into Sutton Place in the summer of 1921. She bought numbers three and five in the street and had them raised to the ground and replaced by a new building designed by Mott B. Schmidt and decorated by DeWolf. And Schmidt designed a colonial style house for Anne Morgan, which you can see there on the right. Um, and you can see um, Anne Morgan on the left there, a very elegant fox round her neck. Um, DeWolf developed the same Chinese theme uh, that she developed also for Vanderbilt in this house. Okay, so that, those are those three houses which I think are very interesting that they're all in the same kind of area. 
now I'm moving on a little bit later. Well, actually, I'm not. I'm going to now just take you through through her whole career very, very quickly through her showrooms, because I think it's very interesting that she created her own showrooms um, in New York. So as well as um, having, obviously, homes for herself, doing these public and private sphere she, uh, buildings, she also worked in buildings she, she designed herself. Now, between 1905 and 1919, which is the period more or less I've been looking at, the scale and number of DeWolf's decorating projects expanded considerably. From the moment she decided to go in search of a professional interior decorating commissions to the year following the First World War, when she began actually to withdraw from the very, very successful business she created, her decorating operations went through several transformations and, had, and the base from which she worked changed. To accommodate the changes, she was obliged to move office twice and to occupy three different business premises. Now, back in 1905, um, she'd worked at home in, in the East 17th Street, the, the little house we saw right at the very beginning. From there, um, she moved to 4 West 40th Street. Unfortunately, no images survive of that, so I have no idea what it looked like inside. But she was there for nine years. And by 1915, she, had, she moved to West 17th, sorry, to West 47th Street, which you can see on the left. And that's just a view across the showroom, the way she showed her furniture. She sort of put it out, a bit like a warehouse, really, just sort of, it's kind of in a domestic look, with rugs and sofas and things on the tables, but fairly kind of open. And people would just come in, walk around, say, I'll have one of those, I'll have one of those, I like that. And then she would compile the, the schemes for, for her clients. Now in June 16, as I've said several times, she, she went to France and she dedicated, when she was there, most of the next 18 months to war work. And she played a part, along with Baroness Henri de Rothschild, in the application of the ombrine treatment for soldiers who'd sustained burns. So she, she spent quite a while actually doing war work. She came back to New York in 1919. And she'd found that her decorating firm had thrived in her absence. She hadn't even really been involved in it. And it was at this stage that another move was necessary because of the expansion. And she bought the Camomile building at 677 Fifth Avenue. The photographs of these showrooms depict a whole range of things. It's a massive showroom. I'm just giving you one image there. Again, it's a bit warehousey with all these pieces just shown there, but it was a massive space. And she showed everything there from furniture pieces, side tables, chairs, mirrors, screens, footstools, chandeliers, table lamps, etc. And she even did little, um, a bit like Ikea now, do little sort of staged interiors as well that people, like a little chinoiserie interior <coughs> or a little um, Louis Kahn's interior so people get the sense. But mostly it was this big open space. The Fifth Avenue showroom remained the heartland of her decorating business right up to the firm's demise in 1937, when it finally filed for bankruptcy. I think the lack of her involvement with it off from the 20s onwards meant that it, 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 it was successful for a while, but it, it didn't last longer than 37. Now, 19, she did continue to do some things in New York through the 20s and 30s. I'm just going to give you a little sense. And these were really for individuals, for friends or for individual people she'd met socially. And the first one I'm going to look at is the Condé Nast apartment, which was built, which was um, the interior of which was, was created in 1924. And it's at 104 Park Avenue. And again, a very sort of opulent apartment building. Now, throughout her long career, as we've seen, she mostly designed for women, but there were a few men. We've seen Frick. There was also somebody called James Deering. And there was Condé Nast. Now, she'd had a relationship with Nast um, very early on, when, when um, Nast first brought, bought Vogue in 1909. And if you go back through copies of Vogue from 1909 through to about 1920, you'll, you'll see DeWolf interiors illustrated throughout. And also images of her in her fashionable dress, because she, she was as much, <clears throat> if you like, part of her brand herself, as, as were her interior settings. In fact, in August 1928, Nass devoted several pages of his magazine to DeWolf's designs for the interior of his Park Avenue home. It was a 20-roomed duplex in a building designed by the architectural firm of Delano and Aldrich, who were the architects of the Colony Club. 
and he lived there and parted there for 18 years. The drawing room was decorated in the familiar French style, the, the slide on the left, typical of so much of De Wolf's work. It had a mantelpiece of dark marble topped by a mirror set into wood panelling, graced by a neoclassical bust of a female figure and flanked by sconces. This is very familiar and lots of French furniture. On the right is his library, um, which again, which is interesting, I, I think again, because if you look at the top of the curtains, you'll see again a sort of animal print uh, fabric. So she's bringing these modern modern touches into the into French, uh, as Louis says, Louis Kahn's style. And of course, in France, she's picking up on Art Deco. She's beginning to get a sense of that kind of exoticism and the kind of materials that Art Deco was was um, was using. And she's picking that up in Paris. Okay. Now the grandest room. Oops, why isn't that working? Ah, I'm not getting any movement on my slides. I don't know why that is. Ah, oh, there we are. I'll go back one. The grandest room in the Condé Nast apartment was the ballroom, uh, which opened on, onto a terrace. And you can see that the terrace on the left. So if, if you were getting too warm and in these great parties that Nast held in the ballroom, you'd, you'd flow out onto the terrace. The walls of the ballroom, which were extended in 1926, were covered with a pink and blue 18th century theatrical wallpaper, which you can see reasonably well there, depicting flowers and birds, which had been found in the attic at Welbeck Abbey. So, um, you know, a lot of money went into this tier. And a lot of the wood panelling de Wolf used came out of ancient houses, often in France and, and shipped across. So um, she would use antiques and heritage piece, pieces when she could. And if she couldn't, she'd get them made herself. And she didn't always care about the difference. It was the look she went for. I think the Nast interiors were among the most flamboyant that she created in her entire career. Nast died in 1942 and his funeral was actually held in the drawing room of his apartment. And subsequently, the apartment was sold and cut up into smaller units. Now, here's an example of an interior. This is quite a lot later now. This is 1934 to 5. So just before the firm is about to go bankrupt. Now, in the first um, stage of her career, DeWolf had achieved interiors for the wives of first and second generation wealthy industrialists. They were the kind of people who were her clients, the kind of robber barons and their next generation. But by the 30s, she was mixing much more with people from the arts and from, um, from film, in fact. And Hope Hampton actually was a silent B-list movie star and later operetta singer, uh, born in the American South. So she was quite typical of the kind of clients DeWolf would have had in the 30s, both in the US and, and in, in France, actually, as well and actually in Los Angeles. And she created an interior, or she asked a to create an interior for her in her rather small house on, on Park Avenue. Having learned from decorating her own homes how important it was for interiors to express the personality and psychological and practical needs of their inhabitants, DeWolf set out to create a fantasy environment for the actress in which she could be fully herself. And you can see in that image on the left there, now the animal skins have gone crazy. <laughs> the little house was on three floors, a staircase, quote, dashingly carpeted in zebra skin with a wrought iron banister. You can see this very elaborate banister wound its way through the center of it. So it, it's, we've moved away from kind of true um, 16th century French furniture and we've gone into a sort of Hollywood fantasy really. And then finally, I'm going to sh finally show you something else she did, which I think is very interesting. After the death of Elizabeth Marbury and the sale of 13 Sutton Place, where the decorator, as I've mentioned, had had a New York base, she began to spend a lot of time in New York hotels, which she then transformed into temporary homes for herself. I think she was incapable of not decorating spaces she was in. It was just what she did. And she's moving through New York at this point. Um, she's, she has a house in LA, a house called After All. Um, she has the house in Paris but she still wants to be in New York. It's still a place she wants to be for some time, even after the demise of the, the firm. Now, for 1934, and I should say that the, these, these two um, designs 
Regis is 1934 and, and the plaza was 1944. So we're into the, into the Second World War now. Now, 1934 was the year in which De Wolf established a business arrangement with a New York hotelier, the Russian Serge Obolensky, which was to provide her with a base in the city for the next decade or so. Obolensky had inherited a number of hotels from his wife, Alice Astor, when he divorced her in 1932. Such was De Wolf's reputation by that time that a link between her name and his hotels meant good business for him. He was delighted, therefore, to have De Wolf stay in his establishments and undertake decorating in lieu of payment. So again, this is the businesswoman get, making a deal. I'll stay in your hotels for nothing and I'll decorate the rooms for you. And they'll become De, the De Wolf suite when I'm not there. Um, one of the most impressive was the St. Regis, a traditional hotel in which De Wolf liked to stay. When she and her entourage hurriedly left Europe in the 1940s, which they had to do as the Germans entered Paris, and she, she goes to, New, to Los Angeles via New York, immediately on their arrival in New York, they ensconced themselves on the 18th floor of the St. Regis. Very soon afterwards, De Wolf began de decorating her suite and she used a new combination of dark green and white with touches of terracotta that she'd recently discovered. So complete shift in color palette now she's using, and you can tell, I think even on the side on the left, the dark background, this dark green. So very interesting colors, green terracotta tertiary colors that she wouldn't have used in her early career at all. The plaza served both as a home as a, and, as, and as a business arrangement for DeWolf, like the St. Regis. And you can see this image of her in, in with her, always with her little dog, always looking beautifully attired in the, in the plaza. The plaza, um, in 1946, when she returned to France to restore her beloved Villa Trianon, which is where she lived in Versailles after the ravages of war, because German troops had in, inhabited it, the plaza remained a very convenient place for her for a couple of years, when, whenever she passed through New York to California. De Wolf died in Paris in 1950. In spite of her love of France, as we've just seen, I think it's, well, it's, it goes without saying that New York remained important to her throughout her life and was the location of many of her most important projects. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening. Oh, wow. <laughs> this was an amazing talk. I have a few questions. I'd like to uh, remind everyone if you guys have any questions, please do so. Please send them via chat. I'm going to read them out. Uh, we have a few ones. Um, and I'm going to start with one that um, it seems that the color scheme for any of her designs is, is very important, even if she, she does like the bright reds or, or the, the pastel colors. Has there any uh, been an attempt to color those black and white photos so we can, so people can have a better sense of that? That's a really important question, isn't it? <clears throat> the answer, I think, is no. There are in the House in Good Taste three or four color plates, and they're all of East 71st Street. You can get a little sense from that, but the, but the rest of them, no, we haven't haven't had them cut although the descriptions of their color is always very clear but it's it's I mean I had to do a lot of detective work by reading the house in good taste and working out where the images match the description because she doesn't tell you you have to sort of work out what's there but but e that could easily be done lovely project for somebody <laughs> yeah um and moving on to um a feel of uh her design um, we see that there is a little bit of a difference between the showrooms and the houses she designed for herself from the, the lived houses. And how much, do you have any idea how much of the difference comes from her or from the client? Yeah, that's a, that's a very important question. But she was very keen to work with the clients to put those extra things in. And I think very often she... She loved, um, she collected um, like little shoes and she, she was a collector and she had big, always had displays of her collections in her own homes. And she encouraged her clients to do similar things. 
and she encouraged them to choose their favorite paintings and she'd help them put them up. So I think it was a combination that she would kind of make it look as if they had personalized it themselves, but she'd played a hand in that. She worked with them. I see. Um, and you mentioned that most of uh, the Frick mentioned uh, mention that she designed had been uh, taken apart. Is there any part that you're aware that have survived? I think the corridors, I haven't been in myself, I haven't been able to get in to see, but I've, somebody mentioned me that the corridors are still there, but then the rooms are now offices rather than, you know, residential spaces, but not much. But, it, but I think it's quite interesting that you can see some of the pieces in the collection now. Right. Some, some very nice pieces of um, 16th century furniture that she actually um, went to, with Frick to Europe to acquire. That's great. Um, and do you have a sense of why she withdraw from her, from her business? I know that she moved to France. That Was that the only reason or was there something else? She going kind on of shifted, in her she shifted life? emphasis in her life to become a professional hostess. When she's living in France, she's giving dinner parties the, um, the Duchess of Windsor, and she, she kind of changes her, her emphasis a little bit from interior to, I say, this sort of hostess role. Um, and she marries, she marries Lord Mendel in the late 20s, so she's, she becomes Lady Mendel. That's what she'd always wanted to be, a lady. She's, she's aspirational all the way through her life. And finally, she becomes a lady and loves her new kind of social position and earns a lot of money because, and she would sort of give, dinner parties in her Villa Trianon, working with Parisian antique dealers who would, they would then, she would recommend them to her guests and they would all go and buy and she'd get a cut. She's a very sharp businesswoman. So she's mm -hmm. moving slightly differently in those years. That's, that's a good. Um, so going back to the Frick, um, we have another follow-up question from that, uh, is that some, of the furniture of the Frick belonged to Marie Antoinette. And uh, mm -hmm. are you, like, do you know if the furniture stayed as part of the collection as well, or just some uh, pieces? And the parts that didn't stay, do you have any idea where they went? No, I don't know where they went, I'm afraid. But they probably were just sold off. But um, yes, you can't, but when, when you go and look at the Frick collection, there. Are, you can't tell that the, the pieces that that um, Frick bought with DeWolf, but they were a lot of them, particularly the best pieces of Louis Says furniture. That, uh, as somebody says, they probably belong to Marie Antoinette. It's quite possible they were they're very um, fine pieces of Louis Cans and Says furniture that Elsie DeWolf certainly recommended him to buy. So there's that link there. And one final question before we end for today, and when at the inception of her career when she started was there a single person or aesthetic movement that particularly inspired her well i think she's very much her own person i, I mean obviously she's she's very very familiar with french um 18th century furniture she knows it very very well she studies it and she copies it you know she's a copier in that sense but she always adds her own little twist but she's not really looking at any other contemporary things I don't think really apart from as I said our deco begins to sort of feed in but it's feeding into this kind of 18th century taste she is the person that inspired others right she's she she was that way kind now, of probably yeah. she, she, uh, I mean, perhaps I haven't stressed that enough but she brought in this use of the French taste really I mean, I mean there were others as well doing it but she she made it popular really yeah um, I know that I said this was going to be the last question, but we got uh, just the final one, and I promise this time. Uh, and I know this talk was focused on Elsie's uh, work in, in New York City, but do we have any information about her house in LA, like about the decoration, style, and, and what, what is the house today as well? Oh, the house after all in LA, yes, which she lived in in the 40s. If you if you manage to get hold of my book, which was written a few years ago, there's a whole chapter on it, so you will, it, it, it is described. But it's much more Hollywood style. It's much more like the whole Hope Hampton um, 
house. It's, it's, it's lost that sort of historical feel. It's, it's much more contemporary. Very more. interesting. Um, Professor Spark, thank you so much. If this was a great talk for everyone that is here, uh, we will send along the link to purchase Professor Spark's book on Elsie the Wolf. And thank you so much for joining us and thank you for everyone that came. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Enjoyed it. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye bye.